I'm Barbara Godley, Director for Environment and Health at Physicians for Social Responsibility. Thank you for joining us tonight to learn how to use the health voice to fight climate change and protect a livable planet. Uh, I hope everybody tonight is warm and safe, especially those of you in the east. The huge snowstorm that we just had, an intense storm with heavy precipitation, coastal flooding, and a number of deaths is just the kind of extreme weather that is made more likely by climate change. That makes our webinar tonight all the more timely. So tonight we'll be hearing how health professionals can help build the transition off of fossil fuels for electricity generation and onto clean, healthy, renewable energy and energy efficiency using the Clean Power Plan. We're going to hear from multiple speakers from several organizations telling us how you can contribute to that process in your state. This webinar is brought to you by Physicians for Social Responsibility and our co-sponsors. Co I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the National Medical Association, Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, Healthcare Without Harm, and Dr. Jerome Paulson of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Before we get started with our speakers, I'd like to go just go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in tonight's event. We expect to have a very full house. We had a lot of interest in this webinar, which we're very pleased about. So we're going to keep non-presenters muted to keep the background noise to a minimum. You will have the opportunity to submit questions. Since we have a number of speakers and we're holding all the questions until all the speakers are done, I'll ask you to type your questions into the question pane on the control panel. You can send your questions in at any time. We'll collect them and we'll address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Finally, I'd like to say that tonight's webinar is being taped, thanks to um, Julia Morgan, our webmistress. And we're ready to go. Next slide, please. Climate change poses massive threats to our health, our well-being, and our futures. In fact, the World Health Organization and the Lancet Commission have both declared climate change the most serious health issue of the 21st century. The good news is we can combat climate change by reducing our emissions of greenhouse gases. That means gases like carbon dioxide and methane. We do that when we stop burning fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Next slide, please. We can replace fossil fuels with energy sources that are safe, clean, and don't heat the climate. These include solar energy, wind power, geothermal, and more. If we can shift our nation off of fossil fuels and onto these new clean sources, we can head off the worst impacts of climate change. But we have to act decisively, and we have to act now. Next slide, please. The Clean Power Plan is a golden opportunity to take effective action on energy. It calls on the states to plan how to cut carbon emissions from their electrical power sector, and it gives the states the freedom to create their own plans. By making the right choices, we can make clean, renewable energy sources the mainstay of power generation in this country by 2030. Coupling that with programs for energy efficiency, we can meet and exceed the goals of the Clean Power Plan, slow the emission of, climate, of greenhouse gases, and help preserve for our kids, for our grandkids, the healthy, livable climate we all need and want, at the same time as we improve air quality, improve water quality, and generate good jobs. Next slide, please. We've got seven months. Most of the states will have to present, present their Clean Power Plan first draft in early September. That gives us about seven months to persuade our state policymakers to make the switch to renewable energy resources. That switch will have many benefits, as I said, from slowing climate change to bringing us better respiratory, cardio, and neurological health, and creating jobs that can't be exported overseas. But seven months. That's why I'm really delighted that you're here with us this evening to learn how to get hooked into a support system and take effective action. Next slide, please. We're going to hear in just a moment now from our guest speakers about how the Clean Power Plan is moving forward and how health professionals are engaging in that process in three representative states. After we hear from our guest speakers, I'll tell you about several great resources that we've prepared for your use and about PSR's Clean Energy Saves Lives campaign. Our first speaker tonight is Lucy Laflamme. 
She's a climate professional with the Natural Resources Defense Council. She's also a lead organizer in a collaborative effort among national environmental organizations to advance the Clean Power Plan. Lucy will give us an overview of how the Clean Power Plan is moving nationwide, and she'll tell us who's organizing where. So let's get Lucy's slides up, and can we hear from Lucy? Uh, great. Thank you, Barb, um, and thank everyone for having me on. Um, there's nothing I like to do more than talk about the Clean Power Plan, and that actually is not a joke. Um, just to start off, I just wanted to do a quick rundown of, of where the Clean Power Plan currently stands, um, and we'll go through a little bit more detail uh, the great success we've had in the last few years. Um, but in August, uh, the final Clean Power Plan was completely finalized, released by the EPA. Uh, it set out standards for each state. Uh, it is what I believe it was, it was actually the final rule came out stronger than we anticipated. It was pretty great, actually. Uh, so now that we've gone through, we get the final rule. Uh, I do want to touch briefly on there is one opportunity in which the Senate and Congress could have weighed in um, and tried to stop the Clean Power Plan. Uh, they did. It happened in November, and I now blanking on the date. I'm sorry, November 15th, I believe. Um, they voted. Uh, the Senate uh, did rule or vote against uh, the Clean Power Plan. However, I want to put two positive notes on that. Um, we picked up three Republicans that said the Clean Power Plan should happen, and we need to see it happen. Uh, though, and it's worth touching on because I don't, I haven't picked up a Republican on this uh, in the Senate in quite some time now. Uh, and those would be Senator Collins, Senator Ayotte from New Hampshire, Collins from Maine, and Senator Kirk from Illinois. Um, and even though the rest of the Senate did, it didn't go exactly our way, um, the President did veto that the Clean Power Plan will happen. Uh, so then, next slide. Do I get to control the next slide? There we go. There we go. Um, so this past year, I want to keep focusing on, again, some of those successes we had on this. Uh, a lot of I know have been engaged with um, the different coalitions in the states trying to get the federal piece of this done. Um, thank you for all of your work you've done already on that. Um, it's phenomenal, and we have our federal rule. Uh, the, the one particular piece I want to touch on, because uh, it's in the news a fair amount, uh, is that there is litigation against the Clean Power Plan, in which uh, a couple of utilities, a number of uh, attorney generals have said the Clean Power Plan is unconstitutional. Uh, that is an ongoing uh, litigation currently in the U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. However, just this week, uh, in addition to the overall litigation, uh, the, the opposition uh, filed a motion to stay, which means that states couldn't submit Clean Power Plan um, state compliance plans until the litigation was final, which could be years away, or it could be this year. Uh, the court denied that petition, uh, the motion to stay. They said that the uh, opposition did not justify the requirements, which one of those requirements is that it is a threat to public health. Um, so it's a very good indication of where this litigation will continue to go um, and that we will have firm legal ground to move forward. So on that note, we are done with uh, the federal piece of the Clean Power Plan for the most part. And now we go to states. Um, next slide. There we go. Um, I, the, the one thing also worth touching on is affects both the federal and state level uh, is that those of you that have worked on climate change over the last few years, including during cap and trade, um, we expected a very large um, and public opposition to the Clean Power Plan, uh, especially from utilities. And we just haven't seen that response. Uh, utilities have been um, fairly muted when the final rule was announced. There was really only one utility that came out against it, and that was Southern Company. Several other utilities are going farther than I would expect them to go, um, including AEP, American Electric Power, that has long been against a lot of the environmental protections we try to put in place for power plants. And they Again, this is, I wanted to point this out because it's a very impressive quote here. Um, but they believe that this can be done and it can be a catalyst for transformation that is already occurring in our industry. Um, they are working productively for the most part um, on the state level and being pretty public um, on a number of ways on why they want to see this happen. One of the other pieces, uh, one of the other main uh, opposition pieces is ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. 
they um, have drafted up uh, a number of uh, draft or model legislations for state senators to pass to either weaken, delay, um, or stop states from um, submitting state compliance plans. Well, that's actually not working very well for them, which I will show you a, a slide in a moment on how well that strategy is not working. Uh, but so far, it's, it's not working again. This goes back to AEP. Um, a number of big corporations have dropped from ALEC and dropped their membership, citing for their position, uh, AEP's, or sorry, ALEC's position against climate change or clean energies. Uh, AEP went as far as to say we're dropping out of uh, ALEC because of their opposition to the Clean Power Plan. We believe we need the Clean Power Plan and we cannot support an organization that does it. That is not uh, a position I ever ex expected a utility to say, let alone American Electric Power. Uh, additionally, uh, Republican governors. There was uh, an effort about a year ago, maybe, yeah, a year ago, with uh, Senator McConnell was trying to get Republican, Republican governors to say no to the Clean Power Plan. Uh, it didn't, didn't really work well. Governors apparently don't like being told what to do by senators, let alone senators not from their state. Uh, so Republican governors, while some have been very outspoken at least against it, it's very much um, a public posture. There's some of those same governors are actually instructing their agencies to start crafting compliance plans. So while they may publicly oppose it, they are still working on compliance plans, which I think says a lot. Um, they know they need to, and they know utilities want it to happen. So we're in a very different place um, than we have been in, in at least my last eight years of working on climate, uh, national climate legislation. And because of that, we now move to the states and get to have a lot of fun with what happens. And it's very important um, that we're weighing on very specific policies because every state will be different on how they do this. Um, next slide. So here are all the states working on implementation. Uh, and I think this is important to, to point out because if you do uh, read anything or, or some of the national papers trying to say that there's a lot of opposition uh, to the Clean Power Plan, it's just not as much as they're saying. Um, again, pointing out governors that have been outspoken. The governor of West Virginia, very opposed to the Clean Power Plan, is very much working on a state compliance plan, has started to pull together stakeholders. Um, as instructed, the agencies continue working on it. A number of these states are, are starting to figure out how, um, how they do this and how they engage the public in their process. Uh, next slide. So this is where um, the public engagement piece is going to be very important on the state level. Um, while I, I said that the decision makers uh, primarily are going to be governors, but they're going to delegate it out uh, to an agency, either uh, typically the Department of Natural Resources or the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and again, that varies by state by state, but there is a public announcement, and most of these are, can be found on the governor's site if you don't know it already. Um, the one other piece uh, where legislators might come into play uh, in some states, the governor can be able to do uh, his state plans entirely without uh, state legislatures. In other states, they have rules where the state legislature gets to review or approve um, any submission of a plan to a federal agency or something along those lines. Um, a lot of times they're just advisory, but they still will make us think about it. Um, the other piece where it's going to be very important, um, as I mentioned before, uh, Alex, the American Legislature, Legislative Exchange Council is pushing forward bills um, and working with state legislators to do this in a number of states. Um, we, we've seen one now introduced in Virginia. I believe there is one that uh, to stop the submission of a compliance plan for Colorado. I think it was introduced last week. Um, some of these bills would give oversight committee to or oversight to any state plan to utility to a utility commission, not to a governor. Um, so there are lots of ways the state legislatures are going after the Clean Power Plan, um, and there's going to be a lot of opportunities and a lot of need to publicly push back on what on on those bills. Again, those Colorado and Virginia are the only two I know oh, off the top of my head, and then Pennsylvania had their own fun um, around their state budgets. But the legislature will be weighing in a number of places. Uh, next slide. 
Um, the good news is, though, uh, they failed in a lot of attempts. Last year, uh, the ALEC, the American Legislative Council, pushed very hard, um, very hard to get bills out there uh, that would stop the steam clean power plan. Only one succeeded, uh, and that was in West Virginia, and it gives the state legislature approval over the state compliance plan. The rest of them, the ones you see that are striped, um, they were mixed. They were weakened dramatically by the time they finally came bills. But the majority of bills that we saw introduced in state legislators, legislatures to stop the Clean Power Plan have failed. Um, a lot, a number, there's a number of reasons for that, both for public pressure as well as uh, utilities. Utilities want to figure out how to do this. Uh, next slide. And I am not going to read everything on this because nobody wants me to, but I, I do want to point of uh, two, two things here. The one, while well, I just explained how different every state will be going about uh, their state planning process, uh, the one thing they will all have in common is that there will be a public engagement period. Uh, there will be a public comment period, and then there likely will be another form of um, public engagement either through hearings or stakeholder meetings. Um, a number of these have started in some states. Uh, Virginia has already had a series of hearings on this. Pennsylvania has had a public comment period uh, and stakeholder meetings, I believe, already underway. Um, Iowa is underway for stakeholder engagement, um, not public comment period yet. Um, but I, speaking of Iowa, Iowa has one of the most robust and transparent processes to find this. If you're ever curious on what it looks like to fully lay out what a state is doing, to, to craft a state plan, go to the Iowa Department of Natural Resources website. It's awesome. And they have notes from every meeting, every presentation that's come about, every upcoming meeting. It's really impressive. And this is the timeline that they've laid out their states. Um, contrary point, their close neighbor, Illinois, um, Governor Rauner has not actually announced any plans um, on how they're going to do this. Uh, just that they actually will develop a plan, and that is all he said, and I believe it was through a spokesperson. Um, however, due to the lack of any leadership there, and because Illinois has a very strong legislature, instead of working through this, this um, stakeholder process, like some states will be doing, they're pushing forward um, a proactive piece of legislation, the Clean, Energy, or Clean Jobs Bill, uh, that would help meet a lot of the needs for Illinois' compliance to the Clean Power Plan. Uh, and there's a ton of activity around there, a lot of great work going on. Anyone in Illinois, I know you guys are already very active there and have been doing good work, so thank you for that. Uh, next slide. Um, and why engagement is needed, uh, and I'm already realizing I'm running a little on t over on time, but this is, this is the most important piece um, of the entire presentation. Uh, the, the public health voice is unbelievably crucial to getting strong plans in place in the state for a number of reasons. Um, the first thing, just on this, the, the inside game is what we call it, uh, it's the private, more policy type pressure that we work with agencies. We have meetings with uh, various legislators or other decision makers and help them figure out what pieces we need to see or need to be seen in the state plan um, to increase, to have the highest benefits or health benefits. Um, it goes very much into how do you make sure there's not disproportional impacts being felt in some communities, because we're only cleaning up some of them. Um, the public health boys and nurses and doctors in particular can be so helpful um, and, and carry that message in with these decision makers, who most of them are not going to necessarily be public health experts. Um, very clear example there, uh, there's a bill in Michigan moving. Um, there are a number of bills moving, and one of them includes burning tires as clean energy. I don't think anyone on this call would believe that we, we, uh, breathing that air in is good for public health. Uh, the other key piece uh, is the outside game, the political cover and building public support. Uh, there has been a dramatic change in how we talk and how we understand the impact of air pollution in the last few years. It is an it, and it's because of all the work you've done, uh, but it's changed how we talk about climate change. Uh, and it's, I do believe, single-handedly one of the, mo the most important message um, that has gone out in the last few years. And it is the entire reason why we have the ability to do this through the Clean Air Act. So we need to make sure that we are maintaining that, that public voice out there 
um, of the health effects of air pollution, carbon pollution. Uh, but additionally, we need that for political policymakers. Uh, again, uh, go back to Michigan, apologies for this example. Again, uh, Governor Snyder, the Republican governor, um, he's been, he spoke out on climate change for the first time, I believe, three years ago before the final Clean Power Plan came out, uh, saying we need to do it. And his entire, it was long, um, was all on public health. Uh, and that, that is why, that is what's motivating him and makes him feel comfortable talking about that because that is something that he should care about as elected official. He should care about our public health. Uh, so I will, oh, and I think we have one more slide. And this is where we get into uh, where, where we have the most robust efforts. And I know um, that we'll be following up to make sure you have contact information for all of these folks. Uh, but want to let you know where the coalitions are at, uh, operating at this point. Um, CDC, the blue states on there, um, that's the Climate Action Campaign. Uh, they've been doing a lot of the work on the federal side of, the, side of this. Um, it's very public facing. Uh, it's very focused on the Senate. They're wonderful, and I, I know that you're engaged with a number of those coalitions. Uh, the other one with the weird star thing, um, those are what we call the hub states. Um, these are states where we are coordinating um, a number of groups for more of that inside game um, that I mentioned earlier, where we're meeting with air agencies, we're meeting with governors, with um, utilities, and it's coordinating that information. It, it's not very much, it's not necessarily a full-fledged campaign, but they you know everything that is happening there are going to be working um, against any, any bad bills that are happening in the state legislatures. They're going to be working on stakeholder meetings and, and hearings. Uh, so those are the folks that are going to be most helpful for engaging on the state level in the, um, for the Clean Power Plan. And again, I know Barb has a full list of 25 of them. You only see about 11 on there now. Um, we have looser operations slash can point you to the right people in the other set of states. Um, and if you are ever wondering, one of us can probably figure out who the right person is to state. But, um, there's at least 25 uh, states that we can be helpful with, uh, but these are going to be our most robust efforts, the one you see with those stars. And I believe that wraps it up. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Lucy, for that great overview. And remember, everyone, if you have questions, write them into the question box, and we'll get to them after all of our presenters. Our next presenter is Alexandra Bryant, the Executive Director of Wisconsin Physicians for Social Responsibility. She'll tell us about how Wisconsin is making real progress on the Clean Power Plan, despite the outright opposition of their governor. Alex? Hello. Thank you, Barb. Thanks very much for having me. So um, as Barb just explained, Wisconsin is an example of a state that unfortunately shows no signs of moving forward with the CPP from the side of the government, that is. Um, you can see in this map provided, this is Wisconsin's lack of electri electricity restructuring plans before the Clean Power Plan. And um, one minute here, sorry. And um, it's further exemplified by the lawsuit against the EPA, of which Wisconsin was a part. Um, the courts, as Lucy just mentioned, um, denied the petition last week, which was a big win across the country and in Wisconsin for many reasons. Our attorney general here in Wisconsin, Schimmel, did acknowledge after this decision on Thursday that the state needs to start making some decisions right now. Um, we're going to have to move quickly, of course, as Barb explained in the very beginning, we only have seven months. Uh, Wednesday, the day before this ruling was decided uh, or released, the Public Service Commission said that they were still analyzing the rule, which is the position that they've been giving since before its final release in the summertime. We're hoping that in the next couple of months, this means we'll see some type of movement towards developing a plan that will involve interested stakeholders as is required by the law. However, in the absence of anything from the state of Wisconsin so, so far, we've been working as a part of a stakeholder-driven campaign to push Wisconsin to start developing a plan. This is loosely organized with the same plan that stakeholders in Michigan have used. Uh, Wisconsin has to reduce CO2 by 41% when looking at a rate-based approach or 33% when using the mass-based calculations. The EPA classifies these numbers as moderate across the collection of state goals. However, the state of Wisconsin has called these goals unattainable due to our heavy reliance on coal, which constitutes, on average, 60% of our energy production. If I could have the next slide, please. So the campaign we are a part of um, right now is working to show the state that these goals are actually attainable and that the sooner they move, the cheaper it will be for everyone. 
Um, I apologize for the line through some of the text there. Um, our campaign is made up of over 20 organizations and collections of interested people, ranging from environmental groups to utilities to faith groups, low-income and underrepresented groups, local governments, businesses, and of course, human health groups. PSR Wisconsin Directly has not only been providing the health voice at these meetings, but we've also been encouraging other healthcare professionals to do the same. We wrote a letter to the DNR urging them to begin a state implementation plan and, if or when they do, to involve us in the stakeholder process. We've also been working with the large hospital groups in the immediate area and somewhat from around the state to contact the DNR with the same message, especially considering the high energy expenditure of such institutions and their leverage in making the CPP more affordable for the state because hospital investments in renewables can then be counted towards compliance. Um, uh, just to, to put it out there, I would definitely urge each and every one of you as individuals or as part of larger organizations to do the same if you haven't already. Or you can always work to urge your employer, work with your employer to write a letter in support of the CPP and advocate for their ability to help with compliance. One example of an organization that has done that in Wisconsin is Theta Care in the Green Bay area. Even if your state has begun moving forward with a plan, be sure that the health voice is being heard at those stakeholder meetings. One additional effort we've taken is to urge our local energy monopoly to consider the health impacts of coal and natural gas as energy sources when making efforts to comply with the CPP. Specifically, we asked for No Coal for Christmas at an event in early December where we learned about the health impacts of coal and then urged our utility to phase out existing coal-fired power plants. One slight aside that I want to add is that whenever I've been at these meetings or spoken to legislatures about the plan, many people have been surprised to hear from a health organization because unfortunately, the effects of the CPP on human health, the positive ones, are not often brought up. The avoidance of thousands of asthma attacks and hospitalizations, just to name a few, or the accrual of up to $34 billion in healthcare savings aren't a part of this conversation. Legislators have said to me, oh, I hadn't thought about that part before which is why more of us need to get involved in these efforts. Through local level cross-industry involvement and statewide campaigning, we've been able to develop a strong sense of community and accomplishment working through this stakeholder campaign. We intend to start the state implementation plan development meetings in the next month or so, whether or not the state initiates anything from their side. And our larger hope, of course, is that the state of Wisconsin joins us and then begins to take some action on our state implementation plan. The key to our success in this movement which will be necessary to develop a strong SIP, is to involve as many diverse constituents in these conversations as possible. Even in states that are moving forward, this needs to be a main focus so that the plans that each state develop are equitable and do consider human health, since that hasn't been a loud enough part of the conversation thus far in many instances. We've been able to take our SIP into our own hands, and that force from within will hopefully encourage our government to do the same in the very near future. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope I've been able to provide a picture of what a state without government support can do for the Clean Power Plan. Well, Alex, I think you really did. I think it's really, especially it was impressive to hear that uh, you're speaking to state legislators who say, oh, I never thought about the impacts this might have on human health. Mm -hmm. A very clear statement about the need for the health voice. Our next speaker is Ken Fletcher. He's the Advocacy Specialist for the American Lung Association in Michigan and the Director of the Michigan Healthy Air Campaign. So Ken will discuss the organizing he's leading in Michigan, which is a state where the governor has announced that the state actually will submit a state implementation plan, but I bet they still need to hear from health professionals. Ken? Well, thanks, Barb, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be part of this webinar tonight. Yes, in Michigan, we are fortunate in that uh, Governor Snyder has been supportive of going forward with creating a state implementation plan. Plan, and he's been acting uh, quite aggressively and putting in place a structure to move the process along pretty quickly. So we're, we're very fortunate about that. Uh, if I want to adv advance the slide, uh, just tell you a little bit about the Healthy Air Campaign. The American Lung Association in Michigan does head up the Healthy Air Campaign that includes organizations uh, that focuses primarily on health. Uh, some of the members of our group uh, include the Michigan chapters of the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics, the Allergy and Asthma Foundation of Michigan, the uh, American Nurses Association chapter in Michigan, the uh, Michigan Osteopathic Association, the Michigan Society for Respiratory Care, various asthma uh, 
coalitions and other groups related to health. So we're all engaged and active around working with a clean power plan. We also are uh, working through a group called the My Air, My Health Coalition. So we have a broader based coalition that also brings in others from the health community along with our friends in the environmental community who are all working to make sure that the health perspective is front and center in this debate over the Clean Power Plan and other efforts in Michigan. If you want to advance the slide. On September 1st, uh, you know, within a month after the final uh, rule was issued by the EPA, Governor Rick Snyder did announce that Michigan would go forward and draft a plan um, and submit it for the state of Michigan. However, that uh, support hasn't been universal in Michigan. Our Attorney General Bill Schutte has joined the lawsuit that was filed by other attorneys general around this, the country seeking to overturn the Clean Power Plan. However, Governor Snyder did uh, very quickly make it known that uh, the Attorney General was representing himself and not representing the state of Michigan or official administration policy when he did join that lawsuit. So there has been a little division going on right now in Michigan governor in Michigan's government, but the governor has been very clear and very firm right from the get-go that he is supportive and that he is moving forward to implement a, a plan for Michigan. You can advance the slide, please. The governor has established the Michigan Agency for Energy and has given them the task of being the lead agency to draft the state implementation plan. Valerie Brader is the executive director and Vince Helwig is the air quality director. Vince Helwig uh, has been in charge of air quality for Michigan's Department of Environmental Quality for some time. So Vince is actually the one who is taking the lead on this and will be the primary person drafting the plan um, as well. And we have part of our coalition, the My Air, My Health, and the American Lung Association and other health partners have met with both Vince Helwig on a couple of occasions and Valerie Brader to make sure that they are well informed of the desire to have the health community very active in this de debate discussion and very interested in having a seat at the table for when the stakeholders process does go forward to make sure that the voice of health is represented. You can advance the slide. So basically a carbon rule website will be launched shortly. The timeline for drafting the state implementation plan will be laid out uh, in that website. The process for stakeholder participation will be made clear. Information on how to become involved in the stakeholder participation and opportunities to comment on the plan's development. Now what we are hearing from the agency is that there will be a, a combination. There will be some public hearings held around the state to receive broad-based public input on the state implementation plan. But then there will also be a smaller stakeholder table that will be put together. The members of that table will be there by invitation. So the agency, along with the Department of Environmental Quality, will put together the organizations that will be there. We have not not yet specifically been told that we'll have a seat at the table, but uh, their announcements that they're moving forward have said that they hope to have the Voice of Health represented along with environmental. And that has been a little bit of a change when we first started meeting with the officials. They were just strictly looking at including the voice of the environmental community and not feeling that there was a need to have a separate a health voice represented at the table. They were combining us as all one and the same. But I think we have uh, convinced them that they need to address health and have health represented at the table. So we hope to be part of that process uh, going forward. Um, if you want to advance the slide. Other agencies that have uh, roles in it, but they're not the lead, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality is also a very strong partner in this process, and the Michigan Public Service Commission, uh, which regulates public utilities in Michigan, will also play a role um, as well as it moves forward. Uh, so far in Michigan, the utilities have been relatively supportive, definitely, of the idea of Michigan creating its own state implementation plan. They have come out publicly and strongly said they do not want to have the federal plan implemented, that they definitely want Michigan to 
to chart our own course and put together our own implementation plan. Uh, part of what's going on with the Clean Power Plan is that there's other separate energy state-based energy legislation that's been moving through the legislature. Our renewable portfolio standard, which is currently 10%, expired at the end of 2015, along with energy efficiency standards for utilities. So there's current legislation working to put in place a new energy bill, and those are the types of issues that are coming into play in it, but the utility have been using the the need to meet the requirements of the clean power plan as a reason on why they need to pass the state legislation. So that's part of the reason why they have been supportive of moving forward on state implementation. So if you want to advance the slide. So pretty much if the health, it's going to be very important as this process goes forward to have the health voices attend and participate in the public hearings that uh, are held. Once that uh, uh, list of dates and locations are announced, we want to work to mobilize as many health coalition partners as we can to go and, and present the health perspective. And then also we'll want to make sure that we have a seat at the table. My guess is there will be one health voice and then we can work in coalition to funnel our comments and our thoughts and our suggestions through that, but we're going to want to be very engaged in that stakeholder table as various proposal and drafts and ideas are discussed to make sure that uh, the input from the health community is presented as we go forward. And specifically, you know, what we're looking for in the plan is what a lot of others are. We want a meaningful process for participation. It looks like we're going to have that. We want to see establish a transparent and enforceable requirements. We want to see reduced emissions from all sources. We want to strengthen protections for disproportionately burdened communities. We'd like to see participation in the Clean Energy Initiative Program. And we want to see an investment in energy efficiency. We want to make sure that they prioritize clean, renewable energy. And uh, we want to inject increase in supply of electricity from biomass or waste. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that there's a bill to allow burning of tires as a renewable energy. So we want to make sure that things of that nature do not get included as part of our, our state implementation plan. So uh, with that, I guess I'll wrap it up. Well, thank you, Ken. That was a great view from Michigan. It's exciting to hear what can happen in a state where you have um, both your state government actively involved in supporting the process and also where you really mobilized the, um, the, the, the medical and health organizations and associations. Next we'll hear from Dr. Sarah Vaya and Dr. Al Bartlett, both from the Chesapeake PSR chapter, which is uh, the chapter based in Maryland. <coughs> Maryland is a, a part of REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, so they'll be talking about how a REGI state works through the Clean Power Plan and also through the state legislature. Sarah? Thanks, Barb. Thanks for ha having me. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the how the Clean Power Plan is playing out in Maryland. I'm, I'm hearing an echo again. Do you hear it? Does, it? does everyone else hear it? No one hears an echo except me? Okay, well... Uh, I'm not Sarah, so why don't you just, uh, can you just try and plow ahead? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, please. So what we are working with in Maryland is basically um, a format where we have a, a greenhouse gas reduction plan already in place with uh, various programs that are designed to reduce emissions. Uh, one of these, the, one of the major ones, is the Greenhouse Gas Initiative, the Regional Greenhouse Gas in Initiative, which is REGI, called REGI. Um, and probably some of the, uh, you in the audience are in REGI states, I hope so. Uh, but what REGI is, is a cap and trade program uh, to control CO2 emissions. And there's nine Northeast states that participate. Uh, and this will be Maryland's main mechanism to meet the uh, CPP target. And so it's a move forward because we're actually pricing carbon, which is the, um, basically the way to go. And uh, it's been very successful, as I'll show you in the next slide. Um, so the way it works is emission allowances are sold, and states get the money. Uh, and each state gets uh, to figure out how they want to spend it themselves. Um, 
So the Reti goals are to use the allow the money from selling the allowances for investing in energy efficiency and renewables. Next slide. Okay, so Reti has been really, really successful. Um, it, we've made significant uh, emissions reductions by lowering the targets. Uh, and a report came out last summer uh, that illustrates that so far uh, the states have received $1.3 billion in um, funds from selling these allowances, which is really great news. And a lot of jobs have been created, so 14,000, over 14,000 job years uh, were created between 2012 and 2014. So this graph is taken from one of the recent uh, reports about Reggie, and the uh, y-axis is uh, basically economic value. And you can see the power plant owners, unfortunately for them, have been losing revenue. Um, but everyone else is winning, winning because uh, <coughs> the consumer bills have been re reduced, particularly when the proceeds have been used to increase energy efficiency, which of course reduces the amount of power used. Um, and um, various programs under Reggie have been um, have been funded too. So there's been a big net positive for the states. Next slide, please. Uh, this year, Reggie will be having a, a periodic program review. This is the second program review they had, and um, one of well, one of the issues is uh, whether Reggie will actually, one of the issues for Maryland is whether Reggie will actually be Maryland's mechanism for, the, for um, uh, attaining the CPP. Our governor is still a wild card. He has made almost no statements about how he is planning on dealing with Reggie with uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act or anything. Uh, and so he may still come out uh, uh, with a negative voice. Uh, we're not really sure about that. And um, yet, I think he will eventually be swayed because Reggie is bringing so much money into the state. Uh, so he may, we think he does not want to see the cap reduced, um, but when push comes to shove, if he wants to stay in Reggie, he will probably have to go along with that. So the biggest uh, issue in the review is whether the cap should be reduced further uh, than um, the trajectory is on now. And um, a, a group of nonprofits called the Reggie Advocates have proposed a goal of reducing um, uh, the cap 40% uh, by 2030. So that's just for the power sector. Uh, so next slide. Okay, so this Reggie Advocates group that I mentioned is a coalition of various nonprofits, including the Sierra Club, the Union of Concerned Scientists, NRDC. Uh, there's various local groups in the different states, and it's moderated by the Acadia Group, which is a consulting organization. Uh, they hold bi-weekly calls, and they follow the progress in all the Reggie states, and um, they uh, let us know which states are having stakeholder meetings uh, and how those are proceeding. Um, I did want to say that uh, Maryland will not be having any stakeholder meetings until later this year. It really hasn't even been announced. Uh, Department of the Environment will be handling this, and they were very busy last year doing a review of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act. So they, they're, <laughs> I think they're all worn out. They're not ready to. Um, to carry on. Could, could we go back to the last slide for just a sec? Um, oh, right. I had one more. I thought I had one more slide. Uh, I wanted to say that there is a uh, stakeholder meeting for the Reggie um, a program review next week, uh, February 2nd. And I'll be submitting in, uh, for CPSR uh, comments um, that will point out the health benefits of uh, reducing the cap, reducing the Reggie cap. And I'd like to 
uh, invite any of you who might be in ready states to participate in the program review. Um, there are a couple of more stakeholder meetings. One will, I think, simply be a webinar or uh, something that is easy for everyone to attend. But you can always send in written testimony. And um, right now, uh, Chesapeake PSR is the only group, the only health group involved in this advocates uh, organization. And I think it would be beneficial to have more, uh, more health people speaking up. Uh, so that's all I'll say about Reggie. Uh, next slide, please. I think we'll turn it over to Al now. Yeah, hi. We just thought it was worth very briefly talking about a few related areas where CPSR is uh, providing technical advocacy and lobbying inputs through multiple coalitions where we are both a health voice and also a social justice voice. Um, on the legislative side, one of them is the renewal of the 2009 Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act, which uh, supports, uh, we would support our, cl our Climate Commission's recommendation to target a 40% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030. Uh, that Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act is also the framework for programs uh, that include our major energy efficiency program in Power Maryland, so it's extremely important. Uh, that's one that we're supporting. Another is strengthening our renewable portfolio standard, which sets the amount of all of our electricity that has to come from renewable sources. Uh, one bill aims to increase that level to 25% coming from renewable sources by 2030, and another aims to remove from the RPS the sources that are classified as renewable but are definitely not clean and actually represent health hazards such as municipal waste incineration. But beyond legislation also, last year our legislature already authorized a three-year community solar pilot program that if it's successful, could open solar energy to the 60 to 80 percent of households in Maryland that can't put solar on a roof. Right now, the Public Service Commission is developing regulations to implement that program, and CPSR is participating in a PSC-led working group that's developing the regulations. Our focus there, along with other NGOs, has been supporting rules that facilitate participation by low-income households. So those are just a few of the additional things that complement the CPP work through Reggie uh, that's going on in Maryland right now. Well, thank you very much, uh, both Sarah and Al. It's uh, quite a different view to see what's happening in, in Reggie State. And as Sarah mentioned, uh, Maryland is one of nine states that are part of Reggie, most of the, uh, the others being um, the New England states and uh, New York. Um, and also to see that in, even in a state that has a structure like Reggie, you can also make significant progress through um, state legislation. So I, I guess for me there are three takeaways from the, um, from the presentations that we've heard so far. One is that there are very different panoramas, timelines, and everything in the, in the different states. The second is that um, there can be real meaningful action and progress even where there is political opposition. And the third that I heard consistently is that the health voice is needed. It's needed, it's, it's still a bit of a novelty to a lot of our lawmakers, and that's where we really um, are so glad that you are on this webinar tonight. As our speakers have indicated, you can help build their efforts by reaching out to the on-the-ground organizer in your state. Tomorrow, I will send to everyone who signed up for this webinar a list of those on-the-ground organizers. And it's really important that you reach out to them. They'll give you specific information on what's happening in your state and how you can get involved. They'll propose actions that focus on the most important decision makers in your state at the critical moment. And they'll give you guidance on messaging as well as on targets. For those of you who live in states where there isn't an on-the-ground organizer, as um, Lucy was saying earlier on, it's probably about half the states where we have uh, an organizational contact we can share with you. Or if you're looking for support in taking actions, I'd like to invite you to join PSR's campaign, Clean Energy Saves Lives. Clean Energy Saves Lives is a national campaign that gives you one action a month that you can take to advance a strong clean power plan. Now, these are going to be somewhat more generic action, actions. They're not as specific to the decision-making dynamic in your state. 
They focus on reaching and educating local audiences and policymakers. And we make it easy. We provide you with specific materials written up for each action we ask you to take. So tomorrow, I'll send you a URL where you can sign up to take these actions through Clean Energy Saves Lives. So please watch for that. Finally, to make all of our actions easier, I'm going to send everyone who signed up on the webinar a link to a brand new research, resource. It's called the Toolkit for Clinicians and Public Health Professionals. It's all about the Clean Power Plan. And it was created by the Program on Climate and Health at the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University. And it has input and some additions from PSR. So it contains a summary of the health effects of climate change. It contains a summary of the Clean Power Plan, for those of you who want a little bit of a crib sheet on that. And then it has things like an information sheet to give to policymakers on the, the value, the benefit to health of renewable energy and energy efficiency. It includes examples of letters that states that groups have prepared in several states to convey their concerns to state policymakers. It's got messaging tips for giving oral testimony or in-person discussions with the legislator. And it's got the dates of scheduled state hearings or uh, meetings for 10 of the key states. So it's a great resource. I'll send it to you tomorrow. We've got a few more minutes for questions. Um, I'd like to ask Julia, who is the PSR um, web mistress, if she can read us the one of the first questions from our question box. And then we'll um, ask our speakers to unmute themselves and we'll, we'll just all kind of pile on, I think, and try to respond to your questions. If we don't have time to get to your question today, we'll try to respond in the coming days via email. So Julia, if you can be sure our presenters are unmuted, um, and if you can read us a question from the question box. OK. Um, uh, Diane. Lynn Takis says, in Connecticut, there seems to be a mentality among the legislators that supports gas. Please suggest what we can do. By gas, I'm sure she means natural gas. And I'm so glad she asked that question. The um, Clean Power Plan, of course, is calling on the states to reduce carbon dioxide, which obviously comes from coal combustion. One of the options that the states have is to move to natural gas combustion, which uh, in terms of some of the con conventional pollutants is uh, a cleaner fuel, but in terms of climate change, which is exactly what we're trying to address, is very problematic because natural gas is methane and the extraction of natural gas, the processing and the transporting of natural gas have led to methane leaks all across the country that are very, very serious. Uh, I would say, speaking for PSR, that the thing to do about methane is twofold. First of all, you need to let health you let need your let to let your legislators know that methane is 86 times more potent a heat trapping gas than is carbon dioxide over a 20 year time span. So it's a very very serious problem in terms of the climate. And then also methane extraction especially from the process known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking um, creates intensive, severe pollution of the air and of the water for local communities. So it's really not a solution. It's not acceptable. The answer is truly renewable uh, energy sources such as solar energy and wind. Would any of our other presenters like to um, add on to that answer? Um, this is Al Bard. Just two quick things. One. Uh, Switching natural gas uh, is attractive, we understand, to some legislators. But the issue, one issue that's going to raise, besides the, the methane issue, is the fact that the investment in additional infrastructure to burn gas is going to turn out to be a long-term investment, which is going to make it much harder to reach the longer-term targets, the 2050 kind of targets that we really need in order to address climate change. And so if people can take that longer view, it's important. The other is, th there's a moment right now with this tremendous methane leak in California, which is being an equivalent of the Deepwater Horizon oil disaster in the Gulf, um, to 
make people understand that methane is not inconsequential and that natural gas is uh, as big a threat and in the near term, as Barb said, uh, a greater threat because of its incredible potency, although shorter lived, as a greenhouse gas. Great answer, Al. Thanks very much for adding that in. Julia, can we have another question? Okay. Um, Mara Herman wants to know about the organizations that are leading the hub. Um, yes, and by leading, we participate and share information, um, but one of them would be a mine, the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, Environmental Defense Fund is also a big part of it, as well as uh, Environment America, Sierra Club, oh, LCV, Oh, really, um, ALA is a part of it, um, uh, and we are working with them to increase our, our information flow there. Mm, that might be it. Oh, it would be horrible if I forgot somebody obvious, but I think that's it. Thank you, Lucy. NWF, sorry, National Wildlife Federation, that's the other one. Thanks. Uh, another question, Julia? Um, Nancy Marling wants to know what will happen if a Republican is elected president. Okay, I take this one? Please. Um, as of nothing, the clean power plan stays in place. Um, if we uh, we will get through this year, where federally there's nothing, a new president can't overturn it. What can happen, and which will continue to happen, is that Congress will try to take swipes at it through the budget and through different budget negotiations where they cut funding and make it more difficult to implement. But the Clean Power Plan will stay in place even with the new president. They'll go after it through funding. And I would just mention that PSR, like I think a number of other organizations, will over the course of the coming months be putting out action alerts uh, when we see these congressional attacks. So we'll be calling on our members to uh, let your congressional, uh, your representative or your senators know that, no, it's not acceptable to cut funding to the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we need them to be funded. We need them to have uh, full freedom and flexibility to carry forward this really important health protective policy. Uh, we would have time for one, maybe two more questions. Julia? OK. Um, this is a question for Ken Fletcher. Is Michigan looking at carbon pricing like Reggie or a carbon tax as a way of meeting regulation? Yeah, as of right now, we haven't received a lot of you know specific ideas and proposals from the state of Michigan on uh, where we're where we're heading and stuff. But I haven't heard that those things have, are being mentioned at this time. Julia, let's try another one. Okay. Um, Joyce Stein wants to know if it's feasible that we can get all of our energy from solar and wind. Well, I'll start us off on that. Um, I would say that there are the, the main obstacle to solar and wind right now is probably the question of um, batteries or storage capacity. Uh, so that um, what we really need to be able to do is to uh, trap those energy sources, and let's say trap the energy from those sources, and then store it so that we have a clear, steady stream of energy. Um, that's a challenge that has not been fully met uh, in terms of battery technology development. However, a lot of progress is being made, and really we have until 2030 under the Clean Power Plan to um, complete this transition, and so I think that part of the answer lies in how serious we are about making sure that that happens. Well, <clears throat> the the de development of technologies in this country tends to take its real quantum leaps when there's concentrated support, including government support for research and the engagement of research universities in making sure that, that, um, that the necessary advances happen quickly. If we could uh, put a man on the moon, I can't imagine why we can't develop adequate battery storage capacity. Anybody else? Uh, I'll just say something about that. Uh, it's not clear to me that we require battery storage uh, to make wind and solar succeed because 
Uh, they contribute power at different times of the day, and they feed into grids which cover quite a bit of geographical area. Um, so uh, I think even though there's ebb and flow, um, it's it's not maybe as bad as it seems if you're just sitting in one place. At, at least this is what Mark Jacobson from Stanford um, attests. Okay, well that I think might be a very fine positive uh, note on which to end our webinar today. Um, as I said, if we didn't get to your question, we'll try to respond in the coming days via email. Um, Julia, if you can be sure that the, um, the questions in the question box get saved. And um, other than that, I think we're pretty much out of time. I'd like to thank our wonderful guest speakers for being on our program tonight, our full capacity audience for joining us tonight as we learned how to use the health frame to make the clean power plan our path into a clean energy future. However you choose to get involved, the important thing is that you do use your voice as a medical or a health professional or as a concerned citizen and seize this golden opportunity because folks, it won't come around again. Thank you very much for being with us and good night. This concludes our webinar. <laughs>